for at the end so that you can unmute your mic and ask your questions then. And now for our speaker. Dr. Shabang Shah joined Indiana Heart Physicians in 2018. He's a graduate of Wabash College and the Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit. He completed his internal medicine residency at Hanuman University, Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia, and completed a cardiology fellowship at the University of South Florida in Tampa. He is board certified in, in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, echocardiography, nuclear cardiology, and clinical cardiac electrophysiology. So thank you and welcome Dr. Shaw. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Shavong Shaw and I'm one of the cardiac electrophysiology at Indiana Heart Physician for the Physician, uh, Physician Network. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. All right, so I'm here to kind of talk about atrial fibrillation. Um, okay. This is gonna be hopefully a lot of things you already might already know, but if that's the case, hope I can clarify, solidify some of the knowledge. Um, or teach you guys something new tonight. Um, so we'll go ahead and begin. <clears throat> so let's see. So these are my disclosures. Next slide. So atrial fibrillation. It's a supraventricular tachycardia with uncoordinated atrial electrical activation, consequently ineffective atrial contraction. The EKG characteristic findings of atrial fibrillation are irregularly irregular R waves, as you can see in this uh, single lead EKG here. There's absence of any distinct repeating P waves. So here's a map of the kind of a global map here, and you can kind of see that atrial fibrillation is everywhere. It's a big part of North America here in the US and in Europe. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this in a second. So as you can see, it's an epidemic. You know, it's estimated somewhere around 33 million global prevalence. Um, and by 2035, it's actually uh, estimated double. Of these, 30% are estimated that are indicated for inflation and only 4% of these were actually treating annually. AF is related with a lot of bad outcomes. Death, about 1.5 to 3.5 fold increase. Stroke, 20 to 30% of all ischemic strokes, 10% of cryptogenic strokes. LV dysfunction, heart failure, 20 to 30%. Cognitive decline, vascular dementia, depression, impaired quality of life and hospitalization. So why make AF our focus? Well, it's a global epidemic right now. Approximately 17% of hospital admissions have some type of arrhythmia. They lead to bad outcomes, 5X risk of stroke, 3X of heart failure, increased dementia, increased mortality, 26 billion uh, direct costs nationally, and you know, if we can detect this and treat this earlier, it can lead to better outcomes. So we have a lot of ways now of how to actually detect atrial fibrillation. We've got a lot of cool toys out there from the Apple Watch to LiveCore, and there's been several studies here showing the sensitivity and specificity of this. So, you know, for example, a single lead EKG from an Apple Watch is actually pretty helpful. And in the office setting, I've actually used this several times to diagnose, specifically on the later series app watch where they can actually show you the single lead tracing. Uh, sometimes the computer gets it right, but there's a lot of ones I'll say inconclusive and actually looking at the strips can make a di uh, diagnosis. When we talk about atrial fibrillation, there's a classification and actually this is becoming uh, I'm sure even more important now with your coders and documenting the exact classification uh, for getting reimbursement. Now, we talk about atrial fibrillation, we talk about paroxysmal that terminates spontaneously with or without intervention within seven days of onset. Persistent is something that sustains beyond seven days, including episodes that are terminated with cardioversion, drugs, uh, anything after seven days is persistent. Now, if AF 
lasts continuously for over 12 months, we use the term long-standing persistent. Permanent AF is basically when you just declare like, hey, we're giving up a rhythm control or we don't want to attempt it, whether it's physician, patient, or both decision, and we're just going to leave them in atrial fibrillation. And that's what we use the term permanent. Now, like life, we can change that. So they could be permanent AFib for a year, and all of a sudden they want to attempt to get back into normal rhythm, and then they'll be classified as longstanding persistent AF. Finally, there is a term we use for valvular AF. So valvular AF is anyone with moderate to severe mitral stenosis or a mechanical prosthetic heart valves. And that's very important when we come and talk about anticoagulation later on. So to kind of keep things organized with AF, we use this algorithm called CC to ABC. So first C, confirm atrial fibrillation. So a 12 lead EKG strip can diagnose atrial fibrillation. A rhythm strip showing AF pattern greater than 30 seconds from an Apple Watch tracing, things like that can make the diagnosis. When we want to use atrial fibrillation, we want to characterize it. Cho stroke risk using CHAS2 vascor, we'll talk more about that later on. Symptom severity, the burden, how much of the atrial fibrillation they're having. Finally, their stroke state severity using comorbidities, age, atrial fibrosis, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> So with the ABC pathway, we have anticoagulation, avoiding stroke, B for better symptom control, and C for comorbidities and risk factors. So we'll start off with the A first. Okay. So A again stands for anticoagulation or avoid stroke. You can see in this diagram that stroke with atrial fibrillations are very, very bad. 1.5x higher disability, 2x higher mortality, 70% um, can lead to death or personal permanent disability. <clears throat> so we really want to address this right away. We use what we call a CHAS2 VAS score. But when we talk about this, we also want to assess their bleeding risk. And we can use the has blood score system to kind of give us an assessment. And then again, we want to kind of clarify whether this is valvular or not valvular. And remember, valvular, moderate to severe mitral stenosis or a mechanical uh, heart valve. So with the CHAS2 VAS score, C for congestive heart failure or LV dysfunction, H for hypertension, H you get two points for H75, And D for diabetes, anyone who's actually on medication or fasting glucose greater than 125, and then stroke. And you get two points for stroke uh, or TIA. These are vascular, so angiographically significant CAD, previous MIs, peripheral artery disease, or aortic plaque. And then if they're 65 to 74, you get another point. And then you get a point if you're a female. This is kind of like a half a point. So it's used to kind of more of a modifier than a full strict uh, risk factor. And we'll talk about that in a second. Our has blood scoring system is H for uncontrolled hypertension, A for abnormal renal or hepatic function, S for stroke, B for bleeding history or predisposition to bleeding, L for label INR, E for elderly greater than 65, and D for any drugs or excessive alcohol. This includes also NSAIDs for predisposition for uh, bleeding. Now, as you can kind of see below, there are some bleeding risks that are modifiable and then some that are aren't. Um, and we take into account, for example, excessive alcohol intake it might is a modifiable one that we can try to kind of work with. <clears throat> so when we talk about this, assess someone, we look at the CHAS2 VAS score. And basically, if someone has a score of zero or one, where one is just for female, you know, they recommend, you know, no oral anticoagulation. Um, now, if they have a score of one for male 
or two for female, where again, one of the point is for being female. So it's kind of um, not a full risk factor, but for those people we considered in the sense that, you know, they don't definitely need to be anticoagulation, but it should be considered. So we use a class 2A indication in that sense. Um, honestly, a lot of the electrophysiologists kind of push for anticoagulation in this setting, um, but if the patient does not want to be on it, it's fine. In that situation, I recommend at least an aspirin 325 in that situation. Then obviously, if the CHAS2 VAS score is two for a male or three or higher for a female, then it's a class 1A indication for to be on oral anticoagulation therapy. Now, these are what we call the DOAX um, medications. Now, actually, in the newest guidelines, we actually prefer these over Coumadin. Obviously, the biggest issue with these medicine is affordability. Um, and so in that situation, Coumadin is an alternative. But for these that are out, a little bit better outcomes as well as just more convenient. So these are the common ones we tend to use, uh, Pradaxa, Zeralto, Eloquis here. And these are the dosing. I believe you guys will get these slides so you can guys review these dosings and everything later as well. So B, better symptom control. When we talk about this, we have two strategies, rate control strategies and rhythm control strategy. When we talk about rate control strategy, it's basically the concept that you are in atrial fibrillation and you want to control the ventricular rate. Now, rate control is a strategy that can be used for patients with no symptoms, after failing rhythm control strategy, or when the risk of restoring sinus rhythm outweighs the benefit. Honestly, there are times when we think people are rate control, but we do a poor job to really assess how the rates are doing with a single EKG. So oftentimes, I'll put them on a 24-hour Holter monitor so we can actually truly see how their rates are doing at home to say fully that they're rate control or they're not. Now, in this rate control, uh, does someone take over my slides? Uh, Don? Uh, I know. I mean, can you guys still see my slides? Try sharing your screen again. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, there we see you moving the slides. Okay. Okay. So when we talk about rate control, we got two form rate control, strict rate control, where we want to have the target heart rate 80 or below at rest and with moderate exercise 110 and below. Lenient rate control is where we just say, hey, less than 110. Now, there was this trial called RACE2 where they looked at lenient rate control and actually showed that similar uh, to just strict uh, rate control. Now, the caveat with this was a lot of criticism, excuse me, with this trial in the sense that it wasn't run that long. Um, and two, in a lot of parts in our world that we recommend is that we usually use this outlook more as an initial approach, specifically in someone in the hospital when they have a lot of comorbidities, you know, if they're actively infected, things like that. That's when I'd recommend lenient rate control. Um, usually when they're doing well as an outpatient, lenient rate control, has shown, again, non-inferior outcomes, but it was only ran for three years. So we don't know how it does after that. So we usually just reserve it for those situations when they're having active comorbidities, ongoing infections, sepsis, as we talked about, with the exception for if their symptoms call for rate control. So in their linear rate control and they're still symptomatic, then we need to be strict. The other big exception is that there are times when AFib is going fast for a while, it can weaken the muscle and we use the term tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. In those situations, we definitely want it to be strict rate control. So this is kind of the way I use it is more of an option as an inpatient status when they have active other issues going on. 
And the real rhythm is because in those situations, if you try to be too strict, oftentimes you're gonna drop their blood pressure too at times, especially if they're sepsic. Now, meds we can use for rate control are beta blockers, um, tend to be first line rate controlling agents uh, specifically because of their benefits and heart failure reduce uh, ejection fraction in sinus rhythm. So it's kind of been extrapolated from sinus to atrial fibrillation. And so that's why we use it. Um, next are non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, such as verapamil or cartazam. These interesting provide reasonable rate control, but some studies have shown that they have improved related symptoms than compared to beta blockers. The main caveat with these medicines is that we reserve these for people with EF greater than 40%, predominantly greater than 50%. So we don't want to use them in heart failure patients. Oftentimes, the way I use them is younger patients, I tend to use more of these calcium channel blockers. Um, oftentimes, they have symptoms of fatigue and sexual side effects with beta blockers. Um, and on elderly people, I tend to use beta blockers because usually calcium channel blockers cause them more side effects to constipation and they tolerate beta blockers better in my experience. Digoxin is another agent specifically used kind of last resort because it doesn't affect the blood pressure for rate control. The issue with digoxin is that it only works uh, at resting state. It doesn't affect the sympathetic drive. So it's used mainly for resting. Once they get up and they get the synthetic tone, it doesn't have much effect. Now, I'm sure you probably heard there's a lot of controversy with digoxin about increasing mortality. Um, and again, this is a medicine that we tend to use very last resort. I don't, it's definitely not a first line medicine. Um, the issues with those studies is that there's a lot, there's selection bias into it because those patients that showed increased mortality were also much, much sicker patients in there. Um, regardless though, we tend to use it only at last resort when we need to. After all that, when there's a time when you just can't rate control despite medicine, whether they're on a lot of medicine, it's still going fast and their blood pressure on the low side, so you can't go up, you've already added the digoxin on board and they're still going fast. There's a procedure we call AV node ablation and pacemaker placement. It's a very, very effective rate control strategy. The procedure generally has low complication risk. Again, it's usually left at last resort, especially, especially for younger patients. The reason is we don't wanna put a pacemaker in a younger patient to have it for the rest of their life. This procedure, as you can see in this diagram, so atrial fibrillation is a top chamber issue where the heart rate is going around 400. The electricity in the atrium communicate to the bottom through the center part of the heart called the AV node. Essentially what we do is we cauterize that AV node. Once we cauterize it, we stop all communication from the top part of the heart to the bottom part of the heart so that they're in atrial fibrillation, but they'll never have a fast ventricular rate. So when they check your heart monitor, they'll never be going fast. But they'll need a pacemaker to remind their heart to beat for every beat. So it's a very effective rate control strategy. Again, tend to use it for last resort. Now, there has been, now with pacing therapies, you probably, we won't go a lot into in this talk, but there's a lot of different pacing therapies we can do from putting the lead in the right ventricle to putting in biventricular systems. So we have a lead in the right uh, ventricle, and then we have another lead going through the coronary sinus to pace the outside of the left ventricle to, to synchronize the left ventricle better. We have his bundle and then also a deep left bundle branch pacing. Um, so you may hear those terms. We can talk about those at another date. With this concept, especially in heart failure, so they have shown benefit because it's a very effective. There's small studies, um, but there was a study that did show significantly less um, hospitalization and outcomes as for including death that was up to 36% decrease in symptoms and physical limitation at one year going this route in some of these patients. Again, it was a smaller randomized controlled trial. Rhythm control strategy refers to the attempt to restore and maintain normal rhythm. As AF progression, it's associated with decreased quality of life, 
but time becomes irreversible and less amenable to treatment. Rates of AF progression were significantly lower with rhythm control than rate control. For many patients, early intervention to prevent this AF progression may be worth considering, including optimal risk factor modifications. So when we talk about rhythm control, the outcomes tend to favor, you know, younger patient, first episode of atrial fibrillation, tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, normal to moderate left atrial size, less comorbidities, rate control has been difficult to achieve, um, AF precipitated by just a temporary event or patient's choice. Now, there are times when people are in persistent atrial fibrillation and they may say they're asymptomatic. Um, in those situations, what I tend to do is um, I offer them a cardioversion. Cardioversion is where they'll come to the hospital, they'll sedate them shortly, we deliver electricity to reset their heart, they wake up, it takes about five, about five, 10 minutes to do, and they go home that day and it gets them into, into a sinus rhythm. Now, the issue is they may not stay in there that long. They may stay, you know, depending on how long they've been persistent, they may stay a day, two days, a week, a month, who knows. But during that time, it's one of our least risk rhythm control strategy. And in that way, we can assess, hey, are they truly asymptomatic in AFib or not? So for example, when they're in science rhythm, no matter how short it was, do they feel better or not? If they feel the same, then right control is not the end of the world strategy going forward. But if they feel better, and depending on how much they feel better, they may want to consider rhythm control strategy to keep them feeling that well. Now, our therapies of rhythm control strategies are cardioversion that we just talked about, antiarrhythmic medications that includes flecainide, propafenone, sotalol, dofetilide, dronetadrone, amiodarone. We have catheter ablation. We also offer convergent hybrid epicardial endocardial ablation, a surgical maze. Again, this is all along with anticoagulation therapy and comprehensive cardiovascular prophylactic therapy. So that means lifestyle modification, and that includes sleep apnea management. AF catheter ablation is basically a well-established treatment to prevent AF recurrence. It's considered safe and superior alternative to antiarrhythmic drugs for maintaining sinus uh, rhythm and symptoms improvement. Now, with atrial fibrillation, these are the current guidelines. Now, I'm going to show you other studies that's come out since the guidelines in a little bit, but currently these are guidelines right now. Um, in the U.S., from 2019 updated, Europe 2020, but for Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, catheter ablation is a 2A indication. Uh, now, for, um, for persistent, it's a 2B indication. And then the only one that's a class one indication is when they failed antiarrhythmic drugs or if they have heart failure. Now, when I say heart failure, it's when you think fast heart rate causes the heart failure. So we'll use the term tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy. In that situation, it's a class one indication. Now, if they have heart failure, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, where they have heart failure for other reasons, and they have atrial fibrillation, it's a class 2B indication in the US um, and a class 2A indication in Europe. The reason I mentioned Europe is that Europe is more updated so it is projected that it may increase to a 2A indication in US upon the next guidelines. Now, generally speaking, in the general population, there's been no randomized controlled trial that has demonstrated a significant reduction in all-cause mortality, stroke, or major bleeding with AF catheter ablation, again, in the general population. So we do this for symptom benefit. But there has been a study, Castle AF, randomized controlled trial, where it looked at selected patients, so symptomatic atrial fibrillation, NYHA class two to four heart failure symptoms with an ejection fraction of 35% or lower. This is associated with 
5.8% absolute reduction in death, 15.2% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure when compared to medical therapies. Combined then it was a 16.1% and the number needed to treat was six. So this is a big study. Now, so this is where the indication came to a 2A in Europe and 2B in US. Um, and this study obviously uh, may push it a little bit more in the US, but this is where we get the idea of doing AF ablation in our heart failure patient. Again, these are heart failure patients that are not tachycardia induced. Now, I'll be honest, there are some there are criticisms with this study. So, excuse me, specifically, it was a randomized controlled trial, but it was only an open label design, um, and they're highly selected. Specifically, the average BMI in this patient was about 29 to 30. So, we'll talk why that's important later on. With catheter ablations, have two technology that's FDA approved. We have cryoablation, as you can see in the first picture up there, where it's a balloon, and we use freezing technology to isolate the lung veins. Isolating the lung veins or pulmonary vein isolation are the core of an AF endocardial ablation procedure. The other way is we use radio frequency ablation, which is using radio frequency energy or heating energy to create ablation lesions around the lung veins. Now, just to let you guys know, because there are people that favor one versus the other, but there was a New England Journal of Medicine called Fire and Ice trial in 2016 that was randomized, evaluated both these techniques, and it showed that they're non inferior. So people have preference one versus the other, but at the end of the day, one is not better than the other, and this trial showed that. Our next form of therapy in the root control strategy is what we call convergent hybrid epicardial endocardial ablation. This is a partnership with the cardiothoracic surgeons and the electrophysiologists. It's reserved for ablations for patients with more advanced AFib. It's a minimally invasive left atrium posterior wall epicardial ablation via sub cyphoid incision. Basically, it's still bulking the posterior wall. And then, as you can see here with their tool, they debulk the posterior wall. Um, our surgeons here is Dr. Barksdale, um, Dr. Prakshak, and Dr. Kurdish. Um, what they also do at the time is they put an atrial cure clip. So basically, they're going to clip the atrial appendage. And we'll talk why that's helpful in reducing stroke. But they'll do that at that time. And then six weeks later, We'll come in and we'll do the ablation that we talked about earlier, endocardio. So it's a hybrid where we ablate the outside of the heart as well as the inside of the heart. We reserve this more for our more advanced AF uh, patients. Now, when we talk about our endocardio, there are, like any procedures, there are risks behind it. Generally, the risks are going to be bleeding, infection, damage to the blood vessels, damage to the heart. Right behind the heart, there's a feeding tube or the esophagus. There's a risk of damaging that. We monitor that by having a temperature probe in the feeding tube or the esophagus to keep it on the temperature. If it gets too hot or too cold, we come off the lesions. On the right side, we have a nerve coming from the shoulder down to the diaphragm muscle called the phrenic nerve. The diaphragm muscle is a part of the lungs that helps the lung go up and down. There's risk of damaging that phrenic nerve. We monitor that by taking a pacing catheter to stimulate that phrenic nerve, to stimulate the diaphragm muscle every second. If there's a loss of intensity or the electrical signal that we call CMAP is decreased close to 30%, we come off the lesion. Despite doing all of that, the chance of any of this to happen is in the range of about 1% to 2%. With the exception of vascular complications, especially given if they are on patients that have a high BMI, they can be up to 2 to 4%. In addition, any time we deal with atrial fibrillation, there's always a risk of stroke, heart attack, and sudden death. Those are well below 1%. Stroke risk is estimated about 1 in 300. Now, to drive this even lower, majority of uh, electrophysiologists in the US have now transitioned to not holding oral anticoagulation therapy for the procedure. So for example, um, I had a ablation done today, patients on Eloquist, they took it this morning. If they came in this morning and they didn't take it, I would give them a dose before I began the procedure. Now, 
there's been a lot, there's these three studies here, cryo first, stop AF first, and early AF. Cryo AF is basically symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation with onset in the prior 24 months showed that cryo balloon ablation was associated with lower recurrence of symptomatic or asymptomatic atrial tachyarrhythmias for three to 12 months when compared to antiarrhythmic therapy. STOP AF, multi-center trial involving patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation who had not previously received rhythm control strategy. Again, cryoablution resulted in a significantly higher percentage of patients with treatment success at one year than antiarrhythmic therapy with a low incident of procedure-related adverse events. Early AF, again, symptomatic paroxysmal untreated atrial fibrillation were randomly assigned to antiarrhythmic therapy or cryoablation. At one year, there was a significant rate of lower rate of recurrence of atrial fibrillation with cryoablation. So again, all three studies kind of show the same thing. Ablation did better than antiarrhythmic therapy. Here's kind of showing that symptoms were and quality of life were much better improved uh, with these studies than with antiarrhythmic therapy. Now, since the guidelines, there's another trial that just came out in 2020 called East AFNet 4 trial. Multi-center randomized trial, but technically not blinded. What they looked at is diagnosis less than 12 months. To be honest, their median day was about 36 days for diagnosis. 37 to 38% was first episode. 14.6% 14 of usual care group converted to rhythm control. So this is a study that looked at just usual care versus very, very early rhythm control strategy. Early rhythm control therapy was associated with lower risk of CV mortality, stroke, heart failure hospitalization, ACS hospitalization, than usual care over a, um, over a follow-up of more than five years. Now, you're probably th wondering that, you know, we all heard of this AFFIRM trial from 2002 that showed, hey, no difference between rate control versus rhythm control. And this is showing something different. So, what, what to believe, basically. So the issue with Affirm was, yes, it was a randomized senior tri uh, trial for seniors in AF complaining rate control strategy to rhythm control strategy. And it commented that it found a trend toward increased mortality with rhythm control strategy. Mortality was highest amongst a subgroup, older people with CAD without heart failure. But a big issue is that in this study, if someone was in sinus rhythm for four weeks and only four weeks, they're allowed to stop oral anticoagulation. So as you know, AFib is associated with stroke risk. So to stop anticoagulation, it's not, I mean, just because you're in sinus rhythm, in our situation right now, we do not. Whether you're in sinus rhythm and you have history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, or we do an ablation and we get you to normal rhythm, we still recommend CHAS2 vascular to estimate stroke risk. The reason is the underlying cause that, co that brings out atrial fibrillation believes that it causes a stroke risk. So that's why we still recommend anticoagulation therapy in our guidelines. But in this study, they were able to stop it. So with that criticism, that's believed why that showed um, that there's no difference, in, if not a little bit higher mortality with rhythm control. Where in East AFNet, nobody stopped, there was no withdrawal of oral anticoagulation therapy. The study did not affect the number of nights spent in the hospital between the two arms. Another big issue why rhythm control strategy did better in this and not in a firm was that in a firm, there is higher use of amiodarone therapy that we do know has a lot higher adverse side effects than some of our other antiarrhythmics. In East AFNet, there's a higher rates of flecainide and dronetarone that have a little bit better outcome as far as adverse effect, much better than amiodarone. The other critical issue is that 19.4% of the study went under ablation. In a firm, there wasn't much ablation. So those are the guiding things that led this to have a better rhythm control outcome than a firm did. Now, you know, with amiodarone, there's a lot of side effects. It affects the lungs, the thyroid, the liver, um, you get optic neuropathy, 
uh, nausea, anorexia, corneal microdisposite, photosensitivity, blue discoloration. So there's a lot of side effects. And so that's why I believe that a firm showed bad outcomes for rhythm control where this showed good outcomes. So C stands for uh, cardiovascular risk factor uh, modification. Now this is actually very important. So if you're on here and you're not a, and you're not a cardiologist, this is where everyone can help to treat AFib, to treat these risk factors. Unhealthy lifestyle risk factors and cardiovascular disease can contribute to atrial remodeling or cardiomyopathy and development of atrial fibrillation. Management of these risk factors. Uh, and cardiovascular disease complements stroke prevention and can reduce AF burden. So that remodeling, that fibrosis that we talk about that causes atrial fibrillation, all these risk factors contribute to it. And these are the risk factors that causes AFib. So we got to work on these very, very hard. So here's what we kind of, when I'm talking about the remodeling in the sense, so when someone's in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the triggers tend to be pulmonary veins, um, but as it progresses to persistent, we tend to get more electrical remodeling. The left atrium tends to get bigger. They tend to get more electrical disarray, and all that creates a nidus of more AFib. And then eventually, it's we use the term AFib begets AFib. So basically, it's the chicken versus the egg. The atrium gets bigger, causes more AFib. The AFib goes persistent, that causes the atrium to get bigger, more fibrosis, and then it's just an endless battle going forward. And that's why we use the term AFib begets AFib. And this whole changes of it, these risk factors contribute to it. So again, we're talking about acute illness, surgery, physical inactivity, hyperlipidemia, alcohol consumption, smoking, obesity, sleep apnea, COPD, inflammatory disease, CKD, pre-diabetes, and even pre-diabetes, hypertension, even borderline hypertension, bowel disease, heart failure, CAD, vascular disease, all of this comes to it. For our guidelines recommend very strict control on this. So for example, for diabetes, we recommend, you know, hemoglobin less than 6.5% because if we don't treat the diabetes, it's a 40% increased risk of AFib Obesity, obesity, that's, and we'll talk more about that, but believe it or not, we recommend a BMI 27 below or a 10% weight reduction. Hypertension, we actually are a little bit stricter on that in the sense that we recommend 130 over 80 or below for the goal hypertension for someone with AFib. And just one more thing I wanna say on this slide is that, um, We'll talk about sleep apnea, why that's very important, because it's a four to five X increased risk of causing atrial fibrillation. Obesity with 2.4, smoking 2.1 X. Um, and believe it or not, which all of us I'm sure on the line do is we work greater than 55 hours a week. And so we have a 40% chance of more uh, AFib. So sleep apnea. AFib is exceedingly prevalent in patients with sleep apnea. If you take AFib all comers, there's data that 50% and small data up to 80% have sleep apnea. Now, there's a lot of little mechanisms believed what why does sleep apnea causes AFib. And basically it's the idea that you know you're stopped breathing at the middle of the night. If you do that enough, it causes autonomic nervous system modulations that increases vagal tone. So you cause really slow heart rates and conduction rhythm disorders. And then you get an enhanced sympathetic tone that surges blood pressure during the apneic episodes, lead to left atrial stretch, pressure volume overload. And again, that's causing this whole remodeling, oxidative stress, fibrosis, scar tissue. If you think of a car and an engine running for a long time, you get rust. That's basically what you're doing. You're causing rust on the left atrium. And this mechanism basically triggers AFib, but it also perpetuates AFib. So it's AFib begets AFib. Now we have very, very good data that you can see in this chart that people that have, you see here, if we do a pulmonary vein isolation ablation and they don't have sleep apnea, you can see the top line. Now, if we do an ablation and they have sleep apnea, but they're treated with their CPAP, the outcomes are pretty similar, but people that we 
do ablations and they have sleep apnea and they don't treat their with the CPAP, you see their outcomes are much lower. And believe it or not, if we don't do uh, uh, ablation and they're, uh, they have sleep apnea and they treat with CPAP, the outcomes are same as far as, so to, what I mean is that whether you do ablation or not, and someone who has sleep apnea and they treat or don't treat, they're the same in that situation. So it's very important that we treat sleep apnea. And again, four to five X increased risk of AFib. So one more thing on sleep apnea. So in my clinic, I recommend all my patients, no matter if their BMI is 40 or their BMI is you know 25, I recommend all my patients to have a sleep referral to have to, to assess for sleep apnea, just because of the exceedingly prevalent uh, nature of it in AFib population. So alcohol. So here's a study in New England Journal of Medicine that basically show no alcohol is the best, all right? There's less recurrence of atrial fibrillation in that situation. Now, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the patients we're treating is for quality of life. So if they enjoy a glass of wine on a Friday night, who am I to say no, as long as it's with moderation. But we do have study that shows that absence is the best, but at least in moderation. So definitely no excessive alcohol. And you can see these outcomes, it shows you on this chart here. So obesity. So you can see here is that, you know, losing. So on the left, you have, um, so you can see here uh, basically that losing 10% of your weight can definitely decrease the recurrence of atrial fibrillation on the left here. And that's without ablation. So losing weight can decrease the recurrence rate of atrial fibrillation without any other therapy alone. So it's huge. Now you can see on the right, that's with ablation. So our outcomes are even better with losing 10% and then you go down with lower and lower. Now, why do I make this a big deal? Because all these studies that show these success rates that I just mentioned earlier, all these studies, the average BMI is like 29 or 30. I'll be honest, our average BMI here, I mean, I don't have data on that, but it doesn't seem like that's our average BMI here. So this is something that all of us uh, can definitely help our patients with. So with atrial fibrillation, we talked about that it is associated with a stroke risk. Now, the way we manage strokes, we talked about with anticoagulation. Now, and we go by anti, we go by the CHAS-2 vascular that we talked about. And this is the reason why. So in non-valvular non AFib, so meaning they don't have moderate to severe mitral stenosis, they don't have a mechanical heart valve, 89 to 90% of the stroke causing clots form in the left atrium in the left atrial appendage. Here's a echocardiogram view of the left atrial appendage with a thrombus there. Now, we recommend anticoagulation based on the CHAS-2 VAS score. So for a male, two and above, for a female, three and above, highly recommend anticoagulation to decrease that stroke risk. Their stroke risk can decrease by about 70%. For the one uh, male or two for female, where I still recommend anticoagulation, but if they want to go by aspirin, that's fine. Aspirin will reduce about 22%. But for people, and that's where we can use the Hasplet. So even the Hasplet's on the higher side, we take into account and have a conversation, but usually we still favor. So for example, fall risk, we still recommend by guidelines to be anticoagulated. But now we have some options on those kind of patients. So people that are increased risk, we have options for them to come off their anticoagulation safely where they're still protected. And that's where it comes in a role of that left atrial appendage and non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So we have a couple of different types of device. We have an endocardial device called a watchman we can do. Our surgeons can do what we call an atrial clip where they clip it on the outside of the heart. Now, watchman for doing the endocardial, it's a class 2B indication. So it's an option for people that are poor candidate for long-term oral anticoagulation. So for with Watchman, you still need to be on anticoagulation short-term. 
but it's meant for people with long-term issues. So history of bleeding, um, increased risk on the has blood score, history of risk of fall, uh, poor compliance with uh, or anticoagulation therapy, or you know, labile INR where they're not in the therapeutic range, uh, less than 60%, um, high risk occupations, you know, roofers, uh, law enforcement, uh, race car drivers, et cetera, um, or just, you know, they do high risk uh, hobbies, you know, working with chainsaws all day, um, severe renal failure where they can't tolerate anthony coagulation very well, or um, other drugs or medication issues that, um, that interferes with the anticoagulation. So these are kind of an option for those patients. Now, we're on the second generation watchman. I know Dr. Shake kind of talked to you guys already detailed about all of this, um, but this is a second generation. It's a minimally invasive procedure. It's a permanent implant. Um, average length of stay are 24 hours, and there are some patients we let home the same day. Um, takes an average about 60 minutes, and you can see uh, from the Pinnacle Flex trial that um, you know procedure success 98%, event outcomes only 0.5%. Uh, and then by 45 days, because most of these are going to need oral anticoagulation for 45 days. And then after that, we do an image to make sure there's no leak and thrombus on the device. And if that's the case, we can stop it. So 96.2%. So this device compared to the first generation is a much better device, more accessible to most patients, and also much, much more safer. So with that, I just want to leave you some contact information for us. So on the left, we have our structural programs. So patients, you know, there, if you have thoughts that they may benefit with these washroom procedures, basically people that are high risk of bleeding or long-term issues, those are our structural coordinators. As far as our atrial fibrillation management, whether we're talking about advanced rate control or advanced rhythm control strategies, uh, these are our AFib coordinators number and then also our main office. And then with that, I'd like to say thank you. And if there's any questions. Feel free to come off of mute and ask any questions, or you can type anything in the chat if you uh, would rather do it that way. Well, Dr. Shaw, thank you so much for um, your taking your time to do this presentation with us. Um, I'm sure if anyone has a question, they can reach out to you via email and or through Epic Chat to ask you some questions. But uh, don't forget to, well, the I see that the link for the evaluation didn't include this talk, so we will send a link out separately in an email to everyone who was on this talk. And if you did not provide an email to log into this meeting, um, feel free to send an, um, a, um, an email to amy.bova at franciscanalliance.org to get the link. Um, otherwise, we will try to get it all out to you so that you can. Um, oh, there is a question here for you, Dr. Shaw. How quickly do you prefer the referral for a new FIB diagnosis? Sorry, can you say that one more time? <clears throat> yeah, it's from um, Dr. Brewer. How quickly do you prefer the referral for, for a new FIB diagnosis, new AFib diagnosis? Um, so it really comes down to first off, you know, whether you feel comfortable or not is really to assess that stroke risk. You know, is there CHAS2 vascular? especially two for male or three for female or higher, we want to get them on anticoagulation. So that's the most important um, to protect them from that standpoint. Then after that, we'll be happy to see them. You know, I mean, after even the first episode, uh, we'd be happy to see them, you know, does it, you know, because we see them after the first episode, it all depends on how they're doing their symptoms. It doesn't necessarily mean we're doing advanced therapies, but we get plugged in with them so we can, if they do need it at any point, we're basically addressing it sooner than later. So I'd recommend, you know, even after your 
after you see them, you diagnose them, you address the stroke risk, uh, I would send them over for a referral at that point. Um, usually, you know, baseline, like we like to get an echocardiogram, make sure their ejection fraction is normal, the left atrium side, just as a baseline so that um, if it is only one episode, we can see how they're doing symptomatic, but you know, that sometimes, as you know, AF progresses and it's unpredictable. It can go to persistent in a month, it could be six months, it could be a couple of years. So it gets us plugged in, so we have a baseline. And then if it gets to those stages or more symptomatic, we can always offer them these other therapies. So I would say again, um, you know, after you see them, address the stroke risk and then send them our way right after that. If you feel uncomfortable, then more uh, addressing the stroke risk or there's other issues or questions with that, then I would say send them over us even sooner just so that we can address uh, that up front. Um, again, uh, if anyone has more questions down the road, um, I'm always around here, so feel free to uh, just come find me anytime and ask questions. Um, Shebang, this is Joe LaRosa with the ACO. Fantastic job tonight. Learned a lot, and thanks for your presentation. I appreciate you so much. It was great. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, sir. So the email, again, I'll type it into the chat so that you can um, um, reach out to Amy Bova. She's in our medical education department for the link to the um, evaluation for this talk. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. I appreciate your time. And thank you everyone for participating in this uh, cardiovascular grand rounds. We have um, our next talk in July. It's Thursday, July 14th, and it's going to be Dr. Ryan Daly uh, talking about calcium score, the updates in calcium scoring for cardiac risk. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.